The first profound question, what kind of a world would you like to leave your daughter's generation? That's a beautiful question. seems like the, uh, like you said, that's the kind of question we should all write down and think about for the next month and get back to each other with an answer. I've worked, um, I've worked hard to um, try to, to develop that vision. You know, that's, um, it's interesting to have a, a vision of a world that's different than the one that we live in. And, and for me, that question, that profound question can be answered both in the affirmative and the negative, right? So um, I think simply the, the closer I get into this, and the more I try to feel it, the more I realize that there's only one vision. And it's the same vision that's been spoken for millennia through the prophetic voices. Just this morning I was reading in Isaiah, and, and you you read the you read the the prophetic archetypical voice bringing forth the heart of God about what the world should be like. And it all speaks towards that day when it, you know all the different things happen. And, and so the kind of world that I would like to leave behind for future generations is a world that's as close to heaven on earth as could possibly be, as close to the world to come as could possibly be, as close to a fully renewed and regenerated, healthy, flourishing, diverse, abundant world. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, first test run and soft launch of the Above the Chaos podcast. For our soft launch here, I'm with my dear friend and brother, Bill Larson, who's going to be doing a little bit of a reverse interview today. So I'm going to just go ahead and pass the baton right over to Bill. And uh, Bill, looking forward to our dialogue. Thanks for being here today. Hi, Jordan. Um, I'm going to be a mystery man today. We won't talk much about uh, me. I'll just mention one thing just so people get a little context and how we met. I happen to be an attorney, among other things. And you called me on a referral and wanted a creative attorney. Tell me what led to our first discussion, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I met Bill um, on a quest to solve a very interesting legal challenge that stumped the first maybe two dozen or three dozen advisors and financial advisors and attorneys and CPAs we reached out to. And, and the, the question at hand that was, was stumping everybody was twofold. Um, this was maybe about five or six years ago we started working on this. And I've been, I've been under the impression that during our lifetime, we would wind up in kind of a epic historic battle for the future of life and society. And about, about five or seven years ago, I started um, growing increasingly convinced that maybe that time was getting closer and things were kind of coming to a head. So I started trying to gather the wisest advisors and different people I could that could think at the level of worksite earth as a whole. I'm a builder, so I kind of think of everything in builder job site terms. And we started talking about the, the issues facing Earth and where we're at and what might be coming over the next 10 or 15 years, what we might need to do in response. And our, our prediction, our understanding was that there might be a need for a historic citizen-led joint venture to aggregate um, as much resources and capacity and goodwill and skill and talent as we could to, to sort out a set of problems and challenges facing society. So from my, my background in joint ventures and, and large-scale infrastructure construction projects, we thought that the first thing that we might need to do that might take the longest was to deal with legal and government governance, because as soon as we started aggregating people and wanting to move together, we would have to actually be able to write checks to somewhere and have bank accounts and have the pragmatic ability to move funds, and we'd have to make decisions together. And so we thought that the longest part of the critical path would actually run through sorting out legal and governance. Um, so that was the, that was the first challenge was a was setting up a legal and governance structure robust enough to be able to deal with capital flows and resource flows and volunteer flows and time flows and energy flows from around the world and be able to coordinate that. So so that was no small endeavor. Um, the second part was that 
as soon as you start dealing with corporations and bank accounts, you have to answer a very simple question, which is who owns it? And so with a large endeavor like that, that question of who owns it seemed like it obviously had to be answered in the form of no one. It had to be a citizen owned, a citizen led of the people, by the people, for the people um, structure that existed on the basis of governance rather than, um, than strict legal ownership by a group of individuals as we often think of that. That, that coupled with a, um, it, with a second goal that I had, which was I had a couple construction companies at the time, and my goal was to give those away into a multi-generational stewardship structure that would be um, stewarded by the employees and stakeholders and various people engaged with those companies so that they could run it, benefit from the operations, and pass the baton to future generations. So those two aspirations kind of came together in the form of, okay, if we started getting large groups of people together to try to sort out the problems at hand, we would both be needing to deal with different kinds of capital flows in the nonprofit world, you know, for-profit, um, you know, loans or investment flows, potentially political flows. And we would probably have companies that we were bringing to the table that we would want to kind of hold in trust and steward for future generations. So those questions um, led me to reach out to, you know, five or 10 advisors I was working with who reached out to their networks of advisors. We came up empty handed. And then finally somebody said, um, there's a really, really creative guy, strategist, um, creator named Bill Larson, and you should call him. And so uh, that's what led me to Bill. So glad we met. Well, I am too, Jordan. It, it was an adventure and it started with breakfast. We met for breakfast and uh, hit it off right away. And to fast forward, uh, I, I started getting involved with you, as you know, on a, on a kind of a moderate level and uh, that involvement increased. Eventually, jumping over some activities and some work, we ended up, I ended up working with your companies and we went to, um, a place called Mondragon in Spain. And I'm going to come back to that because that was a, it's very much a fulcrum of a lot of our attention. Yeah. But before we go there, I'm going to ask you a couple, what I consider profound questions. Profound questions are questions that can't be answered with a yes or no. And the, like Bob Beale says, the human mind cannot tolerate the unanswered profound question. And uh, you and I have asked a lot of questions over these past five years. And we've come to the conviction that I think people need to ask profound questions of themselves yeah. and not demand of others as much as start there. So. Um, let's start here. You have one daughter. How old is she now? And one 14 year old daughter, which is, 14. um, it's an amazing age for her to reach because that is the age at which I fell in love with her mother. And, and that, I think, I think my wife was 15 when I told her mother that I was going to marry her. So it's amazing now to have a beautiful young daughter, Emma, that's, um, now growing into a beautiful young woman at that age. And anyone who has um, had a teenage daughter knows what a very dynamic um, time that is in life. Teaching That's somebody amazing. to have boundaries and to the self-respect to look someone in the eye and challenge them respectfully. It's a hard balance. And a lot of people look at uh, the challenges of a teenager as rebellion. And in reality, they're learning how to be adult and we need to help them on that. So here's the question, the first profound question. What kind of a world would you like to leave your daughter's generation? That's a beautiful question. It seems like the, uh, like you said, that's the kind of question we should all write down and think about for the next month and get back to each other with an answer. I've worked, um, I've worked hard to um, try to to develop that vision, you know, that's, um, it's interesting to have a, a vision of a world that's different than the one that we live in. And, and for me, that question, that profound question can be answered both in the, 
affirmative and the negative, right? So um, I think simply the, the closer I get into this and the more I try to feel it, the more I realize that there's only one vision and it's the same vision that's been spoken for millennia through the prophetic voices. Just this morning I was reading in Isaiah and, and you, you read the, you read the, the prophetic archetypical voice bringing forth the heart of God about what the world should be like. And it all speaks towards that day when, it, you know, all the different things happen. And, and so the kind of world that I would like to leave behind for future generations is a world that's as close to heaven on earth as could possibly be as close to the world to come as could possibly be as close to a fully renewed and regenerated, healthy, flourishing, diverse, abundant world. And so what does that look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Um, during the, during like, so, so let's, let's just envision together. It's like, what, what would the water look like? The water would be flowing and it would be clean and it would be clear and what would it not look like it it breaks my soul when i go for a walk with my daughter and we come across a polluted stream that we can't drink from right and the animals can't drink from it so the water would be clean and clear um what does it not look like i was i was devastated this last year to learn that there was a study that went around the world and took rainwater samples from some of the most remote places on earth and the cities and the country and and even in the top of the himalayas and out in antarctica and and what they discovered was essentially every sample of pure rainwater coming from the sky on earth was contaminated by toxic chemicals at 10 times the level the us regulatory agencies allow in the drinking water of its citizens and and every pure drop flowing from the sky now is contaminated so the kind of world that that i would want to leave behind is one that's been regenerated and cleaned up and renewed one where the soil is um, healthy and abundant and flourishing with food one where we've reforested um, rewilded where humans are living in regenerative harmony with nature and helping nature thrive for subsequent generations and not exploiting it. I'd love for her to live in a world where we were one under God. It, it, right now our world is totally fractured and divided. And we know that if our minds as individuals are fractured and divided, that we're insane. We know that as a society, if a house is divided against itself, it can't stand. So we see our, our world at war with conflicts all over. Um, I would like to see her living in a world that wasn't the aftermath of the World War III we seem to be marching towards. And, and back to Isaiah, that's the imagery of, of people streaming to the mountain of God and learning the ways of God and then beating their weapons into tools of life, beating their swords into plowshares. Um, I would like Emma to live in a world where people were kind to one another and loved one another. <laughs> Um, I would learn, like her to live in a world of, of wisdom and truth where, where we were genuinely with the fullness of our being oriented towards and navigating towards discerning wisdom and truth in a community the best that we possibly could and where we had liberated ourselves from all these corrupt religious and political and ideological fallacies that are gripping and tearing our society apart. Um, it, it's in, in short, there's a, there's a word in scripture called shalom that, that speaks to, I think you sent me a text on this this week. It, it basically speaks to the perfect fullness, wholeness, fulfillment, right relationship, the, it, the total renewal, regeneration, fulfillment, development, flourishing of all things and right relationship with each other and God. And something like that is, I think, the kind of place that we, we all long to exist in ourselves and leave for our children and grandchildren. Five days after my oldest child, my daughter, was born, uh, 37 years ago now, I was driving on a freeway. L.A. was still filled with pollution. It was hot. It was August. It was right around this time of year. And all I saw was sharp edges. Impatient people, angry people, tired people, sharp edges, trucks, metal billboards 
And I just thought to myself, who's going to explain the sharp edges of life to this innocent little life that is now in my responsibility? Yeah. And then as quick as I asked the question, it came back to me, well, Bill, that's your job. So Jordan, how do you explain the sharp edges of life to your daughter? Yeah, that's been a, or the world, world we thought we were living in was completely shattered by those sharp edges. And so my daughter has had, an, has had to go through, you know, the amazing, the amazing, yeah, right at the most pivotal point of her life, like 12 years old, our life collided with abject corruption and what I would call malevolence. And, you know, she got to lose her neighborhood and her home and her school and, you know, friends and relationships and, you know, all the struggle. So it's been amazing to watch her navigate and to try to help her navigate in a healthy way through that. Um, and I think it, It requires the only way we've been able to navigate it is spiritually, like by, by folding as deep into our spiritual understanding of the reality that we're in, who we are, our true identity, our family's mission, why we're doing this, you know, and why we're willing to sacrifice repeatedly to advance, even in the face of that, um, causing our family a lot of difficulty. And it, and it also requires explaining, um, almost whatever you want to call it, your philosophy or theory of both the rough edges that result from incompetence and things just not being handled well, and then the rough edges that result from sheer malevolence and the conscious infliction of suffering on other people by corrupt self-interested structures. And so I think it's kind of forced her, it's forced us really to deeply grapple with our relationship with God, with our understanding and philosophy and theories of good and evil, with the, with the reality of where our life and society is at, and then what our moral obligation and responsibility is in the face of that in order to keep advancing, even in the face of suffering and have that be okay, you know, to have that not be a negative thing, but have it be part of the mission and calling. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's basically to me, it's a spiritual question that has to be spiritually understood and resolved through the, the life's mission and the family mission that, that even a 12 year old can understand, you know, why, why we're on this path and why we're willing to suffer for what we believe in most. You use the word mission and, uh, that's a, that's a big word. It's the idea of, I, I have this big thing to accomplish and it, it captivates my attention and I may go somewhere on at a distance to do it. You know, I'm on a, on a mission, on a quest. That is my mission in life. It's a big word. It sort of implies um, a level of deferred gratification, doesn't it? Yeah. So what do you think about the angry insistence of people in the world today that others conform to their view of what the world ought to be? And how does that relate to deferred gratification and working together and being patient? Because you're talking about a process and yet yeah. do you see people wanting to engage in a sustainable process together. Yeah. Amazing. Let me think just for a second about where to go with that. There's an idea in, um, I'm going to pick up on your word process. So I, one of the, most amazing things that I learned from my uh, MBA at UCLA uh, was in an operations class I took. And it wasn't one of the textbooks, but they introduced us to a book uh, written by a Israeli professor. 
And the title of the book is The Goal. And it's one of the most profound books. And it's a book about operations, but it's also a book about philosophy and spirituality and the ultimate reconciliation and unification of everything. So the, the idea of the goal is that, is that whether, whatever you're producing, the, the goal is a, is a allegorical story basically set in a factory. And in the beginning of that story, I'm going to answer your question by telling the story of the goal. In the beginning of the, of the story of the goal, a plant is failing. It's about to go out of business. And um, I believe the story goes that the employees are going to take it over and try to save it. And so somebody's sent, um, one of the employees takes over and they have to figure out how to sort out this plant. And so along the way, they, they have the help and advice of this Israeli professor. And the question at hand is always, what's the goal? And so when the, when the guy steps into the plant, what he notices is you have, you know, 15 different departments or stations, and each one is optimizing for itself and trying to get all the resources so that it can fulfill its own little, its own little mission. And the whole point of the story is that if a bunch of self-optimizing little units try to take all the resources from around them to produce what they're trying to produce, the factory and the business fails. And so the idea is that in any system, you have to subordinate all the individual parts to the overarching and uniting goal of why that thing exists. And so that's true in a factory. We've, we've discovered that through, through lean and Toyota production system and, and those Israeli research parts. It's also true in our own lives where we have to take all these, you know, different eleva- elements or our different sub-personalities and drives, let's say, and integrate those into an overarching and uniting higher order functional personality that can go out and relate and go on a mission or a quest to become what it's supposed to be, carrying with it all these sub-personalities, right? And where we often see things go wrong is if one of the sub-personalities grabs the, you know, grabs the controls of the mainframe of somebody, you know, it takes them way off course from their destiny. And so it seems like what you're talking about as far as delayed gratification, if we think about our own bodies, we let's say we have all these sub-drives where we have a drive towards hunger and we have a drive towards thirst and we have a drive, you know, a sexual drive and we have a equi- economic and acquisitional drive and we have a drive towards learning. And if any one of those, you know, grabs the mainframe and we're just fully focused on eating or fully focused on sex or fully fo- focused on, you know, economic acquisition, then it takes us way off course. So the whole game, you know, the whole game, I guess, of life seems to be how do you take all the sub drives? integrate them into a functional personality that can exist in a functional family, that can exist in a functional community, that can exist in a functional society and world. And so in terms of the delayed gratification, each of those sub points, each of those sub entities that stacks up and aligns to a functional society integrated with a flourishing environment has to delay its own gratification in order so that the whole can flourish right and so that seems to be basically one of the that it that is what one of the main things that's currently causing our society to be in abject corruption and failure mode is you have all these self-interested little factions and cliques and ideologies and political parties and they're all vying for their their attention and their own good at the expense of society as a whole. So it's exactly the, what's happening right now in our society with a, with a bunch of little ideologies and parties and factions vying for control and power is exactly what causes any personality or community or society to fail. And it's the opposite of, I think what you're, what you're speaking to, which is, um, which is how we, we humbly and wisely serve and sacrifice and integrate ourselves into a, a body, a community, a family that can, that can function and move towards the goal. So, um, yeah. I like your use of the word goal. Uh, Bob Beal, who is a management consultant, leadership development person, um, has written many books and he was a student of Peter Drucker, whose work is widely studied 
Bob wrote a book called Don't Set Goals If You'd Rather Solve Problems. And he talks about how there are people who are, their orientation is towards problem solving. And then there are people whose orientation is towards goal setting. And then there are people who are opportunity oriented. Uh, I could ask you this question and what's the short answer to this first question? Which of those three do you look at yourself to be? Uh, I'm, I, I tend to be more visionary and goal oriented than most. Yeah. I mean, I might even go so far as to, uh, psychoanalyze you here and say, you, you are very much opportunity oriented, very, that that's kind of the visionary, but you know, I, in working in construction, if you aren't, um, in discipline towards goal setting, you can't stay on the critical path. You can't coordinate anything with the critical path. So I know your, your, your disciplines appreciate all of these areas. But, you know, I've, uh, Bob made the observation that people who are problem solvers are often very threatened by the opportunity oriented people. Yeah. But if they can work together and the opportunity oriented person can submit a question, say, uh, saying, I need your help. I think there are problems with this big vision. How would you identify yeah. and solve the problems there? And likewise with goal oriented people, it speaks to community and working together in a mutually yeah. submissive way. Yeah. Often the opportunity oriented people are looked at as the dominating forces in society. And they, and they can be tempted to leave us, leave the little people beside, uh, behind falsely considering them to be subordinate. Yeah. So how do you think that these three perspectives can work best together and what would be the, is there a word that would describe that process? You keep using the word process, which I love. Um, and I think that's exactly it. So uh, I see God's profound, profound wisdom in flinging my personality into 20 years of training in heavy civil infrastructure, which is a very tough execution oriented environment. And so there's an amazing, I, I learned amazing, amazing things, um, by being held accountable for 20 years every day for, you know, series of teams and what those, what those teams are ultimately doing is bringing shared intention into reality. So if we think about, if we think about that, what we just talked about, the goal, the goal on a work site is the architect's intent. It's, it's not exactly what's written in the plans and specifications. It's what the architect intends to come into reality. And so that is, that is the most phenomenal uniting principle. It's, it's every one of us as workers on this work site is here to play our unique specialized role to bring the designer's intent into reality. And, and that sets up transformation. It's, it's so, it's almost spiritual in nature, but it's like, let's analyze as carefully as we can, the existing conditions. Let's grasp as fully as we can, the designer's intent, and let's come up with the wisest plans of action, strategy and plans of action we possibly can to bring the, to go from where we are to what's intended in a, in a defined period of time in a structured and measurable way. And, and so exactly what happens is what you just said, right? There's certain personalities that, that primarily look at the existing conditions and the problems. And there's certain personalities that primarily are able to exist and feel the end state, right? And so what you have to do on a, on a work site is get that all working together. And over thousands of years of building, we've actually learned how to do that. There's, there's very specific process processes that run in order to get massive groups of people with very different interests aligned, working to create throughput of a goal. So I'll give you, I'll answer your question. So I, I think we could design and build a better world 
it, it might not be adequate. We might have to do something better. But I've been trying to advocate for the last few years, we should at least level up to the basic processes we use to bring intention into reality on a work site. We should at least run those basic processes to bring God's intention into reality for work site earth, let's say. And so you mentioned, you mentioned, um, you mentioned problem oriented people and being able to surface concerns, problem or challenge oriented people being able to surface and log concerns and then watch their resolution. So what we use on, what we use on construction projects is called an issue log. Issue logs are like one of the first things that I look at on any site. If I walk onto it and want to know if it's on track, you can pull up the issue log. And what an issue log is basically is you have diverse groups of dozens of dozens of people working on a work site. It's like if anybody sees anything wrong or that has the potential to become a problem in the future or is not known or resolved, put it on the issue log. Even if we're not going to do anything about it, just make it number 297 of the things that we're worried about that might blow this project up. And so it's amazing because once you have a place where everybody's problems and concerns can be logged, you can do something magical, which is you can start to rank order and prioritize them, assign dates by when they need to be resolved, connect them to different activities on the, on the critical path. And so that, so somebody knows, okay, we're, we're not, the whole team is not focused on resolving my concern number 297 today, but I see that it's logged. I see it's tied to the appropriate item on the critical path and it will be resolved when it needs to be. And so my experience is that, is that some of those basic tools, it's like, we're all, we're all here focused on one shared intention and goal. That's what everybody's here to do. We're going to, we're going to understand that intention as thoroughly as we can understand the existing problems and conditions as thoroughly as, as we can come up with the best strategy and plan for transformation as we can. We're going to understand that that strategy and plan, our best laid strategy and plan will not survive the first week of contact with reality. So it's all going to change, but that's okay. So, so basically you have this system that's built to change and, and measure and monitor that process of bringing intention into reality. And then you have the, the structural logs and processes that nest together. So all those per different personality types can work together. It sounds to me like, um, a pretty big complex thing. I've met people who say, don't tell me how to make the the clock, just tell me what time it is, or that's too big. How will we ever solve that problem? You know, kids yeah. who are learning how to tackle big problems in their education and their practical lives sometimes say, oh, how can I ever do that? It's so hard. But when they learn, they can break it into bits yeah. and accomplish them. They can, they can do that. Um, they, they can make progress. So it sounds to me like you need to be able to work with people who don't necessarily understand or even want to understand, but they need to have trust that yeah. somebody has the gift and calling to understand it and can help them to integrate their skill into the process. Was that, would that yeah. be a safe statement? A hundred percent. I, as another quick, quick story to, to match that I think in, informs and uh, validates what you just said is I also learned a lot teaching martial arts for, um, whatever the last seven or 10 years or whatever it's been. And when you, when you teach martial arts, you're doing something funny, right? It's like, you're, you're teaching someone to be an ultimate warrior, right? An archetypical warrior. You're, you're conforming people towards the ideal of the, the competent warrior. And then sometimes you're in a kid's class and what do you see the kids doing? They're like jumping around, uh, playing games or hitting each other with, with pool noodles or like trying to learn how to sit still for more than three seconds or whatever the, the little, the little routines are. And those things are building competence and, and coordination and discipline and strength and um, all the different things that are required. So there's a funny question you could ask is, are they, are they learning martial arts or are they hitting each other with pool noodles? And, you know, the answer is both. And so I think this is, this is the same, it's the same kind of thing where, like you said, there's going to be very, very few people that want to go through through the full discipline and pain and suffering to become masters in different areas. And so that's where I think 
you mentioned the word trust. We we need we are designed to operate. We are designed to co-operate as a body, and a body has a bunch of differentiated organ systems, right? And and those stack up and align. And so there's so many areas. It's that was one of the things that um, that my grandfather told me over and over again. He my grandfather was a successful entrepreneur that started um, started the largest earth moving company on the west coast of the United States here and taught me a lot. But, but one of the things that he always said is he said, I discovered very early on, I could always find somebody to do anything that needed to be done better than I could do it. Mm. And so that humility to go, okay, there's these things that need to be done. And, and each of them is complicated. We don't, you know, it's complicated to build things. It's complicated to market things. It's complicated to sell things. It's complicated to administer things. It's complicated to account for things. It's complicated to, you know, hold human beings together for long enough so that they could possibly do something meaningful. It's hard to convene. It's hard to facilitate. All those things are hard. And so I think that that trust or cohesion of a body, right? To say, okay, here, here's the small part I can play. Here's my unique skill, gift, or calling. And I, I recognize and trust that there's others resonant with this spirit and moving in the same direction who have spent the last 20 years, uh, you know, in their unique skill, gift, and calling. And what makes everything possible is if we can come up with the trust and cohesion to start to cooperate as one body. That, that theme, that the goal, one, one body, one nation under God, one citizenship under God, each playing our unique, diverse, you know, roles and responsibilities and honoring and respecting those differences. And in our last couple of years of convening, you mentioned the different personality types and, and we've seen over and over again, those kind of collide and repel each other. You'll have, you know, top down thinkers and bottom up thinkers and visionary opportunity oriented people and problem solvers. And you try to bring them into the same room and, and very often they can't hang in long enough to build the trust and mutual respect and honor to, to do something together. Cause they, you know, the, the problem solvers go, you guys are just, you know, your head's in the clouds. I'm out of here to go work on my problem that I'm trying to solve. Right. And while they're trying to solve that little problem, the visionaries are going, look, we're, we're never going to get anywhere if we don't have the big picture. Right. So in, in the. In the, the other side of those prophetic words, there's always the great reconciliation and return of, of the fathers to the sons, of the mothers to the daughters, of the opportunity-oriented problem solvers. That's not actually in prophecy, but it's one of those things, right? It's like all those polar forces need to come back together. And when the generations come back together, when the polar forces come together, when the masculine and feminine comes back together, and when all those things are, are mutually honoring and rightly ordered and related, then the define symphony can sound. It seems to me like you're uh, describing more than job function, but you're describing character development because without that, we can't work together. Yeah. Uh, it's, it reminded me of uh, something my, um, it takes so many forms, right? Teaching a child to be patient is a process. My daughter has taught her three sons who are 10, eight and five, that instead of complaining that you don't like something when someone offers it to you and saying, oh, yuck. And she's done this very gently, continually. No, we don't. We don't complain. We say, no, thank you. It's not my favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, at, at three years old, it's very hard. It, it, that's a lesson. That's a tough one. But by my, the my... time they all do that now. We, yeah. but they were over at our place and Rose said to some, one of them, um, would you like some whatever, you know, along with your whatever, uh, we were having a, a meal and he said, well, that's not my favorite thing. And it was, but my, my, but at it, three, it, my daughter, my daughter's was no, thank you much. <laughs> would you like, no, yeah. no, thank you much. Uh, often with fear. <laughs> but we think of these as the small things, but if we can't learn little Character qualities like listening to one another, giving yeah. someone a chance to explain themselves, speaking politely. It seems like this, it, it kind of breaks down. So this brings us to, um, to, uh, back around to, um, Mondragon. 
when uh, I've been working with you for some time and you, you said, we're going to, four of us are going to go to Mondragon and you invited me to come along and we joined that group from, um, uh, University of San Diego, I think it was, um, their masters and PhD programs combined to send a group over to Mondragon. Um, let's talk about Mondragon and what, um, where they came from briefly, because you, you've been there twice. You had already been there once when we, we went over, but tell us why Mondragon started in, in brief terms. And then let's get in. I have a couple questions regarding what you encountered and what we all encountered over there. Yeah. Yeah. The story of Mondragon's worth telling. So as I started, um, pondering more just. As I came to the conclusion that the way that we were structuring our economic system and issues of ownership and stewardship and these different things were inherently unjust, um, as I grew increasingly uncomfortable being the sole owner of a company with whatever, 150 people working harder than I was. And, you know, as I watched over time, um, laborers and mechanics and operators being exploited and getting a very inappropriate share of the spoils, let's say inside of these, um, these companies around the world that I was, I was working, started deeply pondering what is a more just what does a more just economy look like? What is economic justice? What is socioeconomic justice? What do those things, like if we were to understand the heart of God as best we could and God's wisdom and deep desire for justice and apply that to economy, what might it look like? And what it doesn't look like, I think a lot of us feel is it probably doesn't look like poor workers slaving away tirelessly while the CEOs make 350 times as much money as them. Right. So I started learning about this, uh, experiment called Mondragon and, and it's one of the first things that most people come across as they start to really start to look into different experiments and more just economic systems. And I ended up, um, taking two trips over to Spain, over to the Basque region of Spain with the um, you know, one of the leading professors in the United States, and he's led uh, groups of graduate students over there for the last, I think, 20 or 30 years. David and Sherry Herrera, um, I love you guys, and, and thank you so much for being, being part of my educational journey. Um, but so I, I took uh, two trips over there with, with Professor Herrera and groups of grad stu students, and then on my second one, took Bill and a couple other executives over to, to study the model. Mondragon started... Um, after World War II in the Basque region of Spain. And um, it was a mess. It was a mess socially. It was a mess economically. It was a mess religiously. It was a mess in, in every sense of the word. Trust was shattered. You know, the people of the Basque region felt that they were, they were sold out. They didn't trust uh, the government. They didn't trust the church. They didn't trust the unjust collusion between church and state. They were, they were fragmented and divided and struggling. And so there was a Catholic, uh, there was a Catholic priest, um, Jose Arizmendi Arrieta that was in the area. And he spent, as I understand it, 10 or 15 years talking about a vision for a more just economic system and what could be done. And so he traveled around and he spoke and everybody would say, yeah, 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 let's do it. And nothing happened and nothing happened and nothing happened. And so every week he would, uh, he would keep talking about it. They have a um, weather condition in, in the Basque region of Spain they call Zuri Murray. And, and what the locals describe, I, I was lucky enough to be able to communicate and maintain relationship with a couple of the wisdom keepers from, from that tradition. But they said it was kind of like, it, Zuri Murray is like a, light, like a light mist or rain that you walk in and it's not really rain, but it gets you wet. And so they kind of described Ari, Ari's Mendy's constant messages and exhortations over 10 or 15 years like that, like that mist. And eventually they all got wet in it. And eventually a few people got wet enough that they quit their job working for the unjust corporate structure that wouldn't give them, 
that wouldn't educate them, wouldn't help them, wouldn't help take care of their health needs, et cetera. Five guys decided they were going to start a cooperative and they started making, I think their first one was making parts for a, appliance parts for ovens or something like that. And what happened over the next period of time is that experiment grew out into what is now um, a, a federation of worker-owned cooperatives with, I believe, over 100,000 worker owners in it right now, maybe 13 or $14 uh, billion dollars a year of revenue. It's, it's, a, it's a very major operation and, and a major success story and major challenges as they've tried to um, spread it around the world and, and empower other workers around the world to come together into these cooperative structures. They've hit all sorts of roadblocks that we've been doing our best to, to study together. Um, so anyway, Mondragon is a powerful example. If, if you have not heard of it, um, we'll hopefully drop a link in the show notes and um, be happy to study that together a little bit. So um, what surprised you the most about what you saw at Mondragon? What surprised me the most was probably just getting to live and be for a week in a society completely permeated by a different socioeconomic idea. So it's amazing what's happened over time because kids, so the basic idea is there is a cooperative and, and worker ownership. But what the amazing thing that happened is they discovered they needed to teach these things from youth. So they have cooperatively run preschools and cooperatively run kindergartens and cooperatively run elementary schools. And by the time kids are in elementary school, um, they're doing flexible project-based learning in peer groups where they have to cooperate together and solve problems. And the teachers are there not as overlords filling them with industrial knowledge, but as guides to help that project-based learning process. There's a, there's a great book that is difficult to find, but it's called The Pedagogy of Trust. We talked about that word a little bit. But the whole point of that book is to look at children not as empty vessels to be filled with the industrialized knowledge that they need to function as a cog in the machine we've set up, but to look at them as unique beings, you know, filled with the spirit of God who are on earth to make a difference in whatever their unique way is. And so the teachers, basically the teachers who don't call themselves teachers, the, the guides that are there to facilitate the learning and development process of children view their responsibility as basically to support and help each of those children develop into the fullness of their unique potential while learning to work cooperatively in groups to tackle the, the challenges at hand. So it's amazing. I mean, you, you, we go to the schools that are cooperatively run, you go to the university that's cooperatively run, you go to different businesses that are cooperatively run, banks that are cooperatively run, healthcare systems that are cooperatively run. In the evenings, um, the, the director was kind enough to invite us to his dinner club, a, a gastronomic club that's cooperatively run in one of the buildings in town. And so everything, morning, morning, noon, night, education, sports teams, everything centers around this basic action of we are the, we are the co-owners of our community. We are the co-owners of our businesses. We are the co-owners of our families. We're the co-owners of our sports teams. We're the co-owners of our restaurants. And everything's just like that decades. And so it's a, it's a vision and an experience of something completely different that could be. And it, it, is, um, it is very surprising to witness and beautiful. Well, I have to say I was uh, quite impressed by the enthusiasm, the order, and the efficiency of that. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, isn't that cooperative thing all just a bunch of communism? <laughs> it sure isn't. It's private ownership, but it's, it's, it's truly, how would you describe the difference between what some people think is communism and socialism and a cooperative. And by the way, there are like 10,000 cooperatives in the United States in the agriculture realm and, in, and yeah. there are cooperatives elsewhere. So people aren't very well educated about how a cooperative function unless you are actually involved in one. So what do you think yeah. about that? In a, in a different um, podcast, 
maybe we should have a round table talking about the false dichotomy and brainwashing around capitalism and socialism. Um, we, I, I think that it's not incompetence. I think it is malevolence the way that we as a society have been brainwashed into this or that left or right Republican or Democrat ca capitalist or socialist. And it, and it's like, it, 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 what it leaves is this very distorted, elementary, simplified, and malevolently tainted understanding of a false dichotomy that doesn't exist. And so the, the, for people wondering about this, this has been, I have frequently been called a communist and socialist as I've talked about how you could organize more just economic systems. So communism and socialism speak to ownership and control by government and communism being, let's say the most complete form of absolute ownership and control, not just by government, but by centralized government. Totally separate from, and then let's say that on, so let's say that at the polar forces, you have completely unregulated, self-interested drive towards individual acquisition. And on the far other side, and, and that's no regulation, it's, it's no government support, it's no bailouts, it's no nothing, pure free market. And then on the other side, you have absolute control by a centralized government who's going to try to decide and calculate what needs to be done for a society. And both of those are, are stupid and wrong and have killed millions of people. And so what we have is neither one of those, even in the United States today, we don't have a capitalist society or we wouldn't have the type of collusive federal government involvement in the economy and constant bailouts and government interventions and subsidies and economic wars and use of our military to back corporate, like none of that is free market. So what cooperatives are, are basically just the idea that we, the people, co-own the means of production, let's say, or our, or our shared, um, our shared economic structures. And so I, I mentioned earlier that, that we went on a multi-year journey. It took years really to try to articulate these issues and understand legally how you'd instantiate more just economic systems given the legal context that already exists. It's an amazingly profound question. And so, so what, what, as we, we were deeply pondering the, the first principles and core values, it seems like from our spiritual traditions, the, the governing value relative to economy or material things is something like stewardship. It's something like the understanding that Everything belongs to God and future generations, so to speak. We are here on earth as individuals and communities for a very short time. We are temporarily entrusted with things that don't belong to us and we don't control, but we are something like a steward or a custodian or a guardian of that which is entrusted to us for future generations. And you can find a, a, a thousand biblical stories or parables that, that would bring that forward. And and, and obviously that's the understanding of indigenous tribes and traditions as well in many cases around the world. So what a cooperative is, is basically a form of local economic self-governance where we're not working for a distant, corrupt owner exploiting us. We, the people, are the owner of our companies. What's amazing about Mondragon and where it, where it necessarily goes beyond limited forms of employer ownership or, or other things is once you decide that we, the people, are no longer going to work for the elite overlords exploiting us and we are going to take back control of our own lives and localities and means of production and companies and we are going to steward them in common and make decisions together and, and steward these for future generations, train people and pass the baton in a multi-generational system. Once you decide that and you decide not only are Bill and I and our hundred friends going to do this, but you all want to do that too. We all want that same self-determination and agency and co-ownership and cooperation. It is, it is very foolish for each of us to try to do that in isolation and reinvent the wheels. 
And so what you end up having is, is the desire, the natural desire for higher order functional unity, coordination, service, support among a federation of locally governed and controlled worker-owned cooperatives. And so that's kind of what, what Mondragon brings to life is what that might look like. If you think of individual cooperatives like cities, they then organize them into second degree cooperatives that are kind of like counties that are then organized by theme around things that, that matter by domain, let's say that's kind of like a state. And then at, at the top, they have a very, very, very small, like an, an extraordinarily small quote unquote federal function that handles the bare minimum things that are required to keep that whole body functioning. So I guess that's how I would describe cooperatives. It's, it's individual and local economic stewardship and self-determination. So in that sense, it's the opposite of communism and socialism. It's, it's fully of the people, by the people, governed by the people, owned by the people, um, economy. That's, that's, I think, closer to where we're headed as a society. I was profoundly um, um, touched by the sense of community over there and also how Mondragon inspired the development of about 1,200 other cooperatives in the Basque region that are not affiliated with Mondragon at all, but they're patterned after Mondragon. It just worked. And I didn't see any homelessness. I didn't see any poverty over there. It's the second richest um, independent autonomous region of Spain after Catalonia. Um, and it came from such um, devastation. You know, Hitler practiced yeah. the Blitzkrieg by with Franco's consent in the Bosque region and the world, it it you know, Hemingway got upset about that and that's why he went to Spain and he wrote from there and he fought in there in the in the, the Spanish Civil War. You can ponder how this would affect you to be um, just bombed into oblivion by your own governments. Um, hireling, you know, which was Hitler, but, but it's hard to ex understand how it would affect people's minds unless you go somewhere where it's actually affected their minds. Yeah. Um, and I, I appreciated seeing that. So one of the things that, um, was interesting was the governance structure. They had a governance structure that allowed for the a continuity. And one element of that governance structure was that they they put right within their constitution this idea that the highest paid would never be paid more than seven times the lowest full-time membership um, yeah. salary. What do you think about yeah. that? It's a vision of a far more just um, way of being. Um, there's, a, there's amazing, when, when we were doing our early economic experiments, we, we patterned it around that and it worked just fine. You know, we, we could, we discovered that it was completely possible to hire and recruit and train world-class talent who not only accepted, but celebrated the opportunity to be in a more just structure like that. So they have stories where they describe, um, you know, their, let's say one of their executives from one of the large grocery cooperatives is going to a European conference of grocers. And so the president of the, you know, one of the Mondragon, um, cooperative grocers is going and he's making, um, let's, let's just pretend that in that cooperative, the lowest paid member makes 30,000 euros a year. And so he might be making 200,000 euros a year. And there's such a deep structure of care around education and how our kids are all being taken and healthcare and how we're all taking care of each other. And what happens if, if we lose our job or our company for a period of time and how will we be taken care of? And what about our retirement? And what about the integrity of our community? And what about all the things we need to provide for? And when there's such a healthy, deep ecosystem of all these cooperatively run elements of society conspiring to help every family flourish, you discover that at 
200 grand a year, you have everything you need. You can, you can be on vacation for six weeks a year and your kids can go to university and get world-class education and jobs and you can retire comfortably and you have everything you need. And so they actually, you know, they don't accept as a culture, you know, some citizens having to, um, you know, walk miles in uncomfortable conditions to slave away at work while other citizens roll through in their Rolls Royce phantoms to the, to the front, to the front of the line. It's just not tolerated. And if there was anybody who acted in that way, they would be, they would be kindly, you know, excommunicated from the society or put in their place. And so it's just a culture of, of mutual, mutual care, but they describe the experiences of those executives who go to those conferences, not as one of envy, like I could, you know, why am I stuck slaving away in this more just economic model? I could just leave and go serve the empire and make 10 times as much. Like, no, there's this deep sense of pride and commitment where you feel sorry for the executives making five times as much as you, you know, slaving away for their corporate overlords in a totally unjust and failing system. So, so it's, it like becomes the all these little nodes become like the cities on a hill. They become like the little bastions of light and proper order where people then are deeply incentivized to, um, to attempt to carry them on. Jordan, you know that recently we had a discussion about um, legacy, and I told you I've been kind of rethinking my own view of my own legacy. What do you feel... Um, should describe a person's or can describe a person's true legacy how would you find true legacy in the world legacy feels something like the what's left when we're no longer left. <laughs> it's like what parts of us live on when we're gone, what aspects of our existence. So we're, we're thrown into the earth in a time and place and we, ex we exist for a very short window. And then we, we dissolve back into the earth and our souls are reunited to God. And so what remains in reality as a result of that brief window of existence, like what parts does anybody know or care about that are still lingering behind? And, and what I'm going to give one example of where I think legacy is not working as an illustration. When I, when I started my first construction company, humans have been building for thousands and thousands of years. Maybe that's one of the oldest professions is how we build, how we, how we shelter ourselves, right? From the most primitive ways to the most magical things that have ever been constructed over the course of multi-generational projects, which we should revive, by the way, this, this notion that multiple generations are engaged in building a cathedral that we will never get to experience, but we're building it together over the next 500 years because it matters. And we're going to take the time to make it beautiful so that people are enjoying it 2000 years from now. So, but, but, when I started that first company, it's like, okay, uh, day one, no laptop, no contractor's license, um, nothing, uh, me and a friend sitting in a living room. It's like, okay, uh, let's, let's go. Uh, maybe we should get a couple computers. Good. That's day one. Um, we should apply for a contractor's license that day too. And you, and then you get going and then, it, okay, we're going to set up our systems. Um, so we need accounting systems for construction and, and whatever. And then by the time we, we started winning tens of millions of dollars worth of work and we're, we're needing to upscale those infrastructure, it's like, all right, we're ready. We're going we're gonna to invest you know, a half million dollars in a, a beautiful piece of technology. I was shocked at the level of reinventing the wheel we were doing. It's like the questions of how should we structure our chart of accounts? Like, how should we set up these different workflows? How should we set up the processes? All these different things. And we talked to the leading, the leading companies in each of these areas. And it was like, we were having the conversation for the first time. It's like, haven't 10 million construction companies 
already started? And shouldn't this be kind of just natural and out of the box and like ready to go? <laughs> Haven't 27 generations of contractors feel like figured out how to do this. And if we want as a society, our builders to be building meaningful things, like we should just be empowering them and passing the baton. And so I think this idea of passing the baton and continuity is if, if generations go from generation to generation, it's like we can build, build, build for ourselves, and then our work dies and the next generation starts over, right? So you, you have these, it's maybe still trending upward, but it's, it's choppy. If we, I think in a proper functioning society where we were stewarding what we had for the benefit of future generations and training and passing the baton, what you would end up with is a system designed for every aspect of flourishing that we need and every generation that's coming is improving what the previous generation did training the next generation passing the baton and remaining meaningfully engaged in mentorship and community like throughout the end of their life and it, and as opposed to that what we see happening is like i can't tell you being in being in vistage and different ceo peer groups and and being surrounded by executives for the last decade, I can't tell you how many people I watched build over a lifetime, decades, these valuable companies, or maybe it's a third generation company and now there's no one to pass the baton to. So they sell it to private equity. Mm -hmm. All their most trusted friends, allies, and coworkers built over the decades are, are ruthlessly laid off one at a time. The companies are stripped apart. They're repackaged and they're sold 18 months later. And, and the entire incentive is to get rid of every 50 or hundred thousand or $300,000 person you possibly can, because every person you fire is a 10 X multiple on the sale. Cause you're stripping out all the costs. So then what you end up with is these individuals who have built companies, hooray, we sold it for $50 million and now we have no platform, no meaningful mentoring, no meaningful community. And we're sitting alone in a country club watching our lives work being strategically dismantled by economic sharks. It's like the wrong, it's the wrong thing. It's like people, it's so valuable. It's so hard to build. You can, it takes decades to build all those things. It could be a legacy, but instead we like vaporize them we exchange it for money and vaporize it. So one of the things that Bill and I have, have worked on the most over the last four years is, is we're at a moment in history where, where a generation of builders has built all the foundations, all the companies, all the processes, all the technologies, everything that's needed for the future. And we don't know how to pass that baton. And I, and, and we know we don't know how to pass the baton. Like we've studied all the different ways to do this. And it turns out that if you just give all the equity to your kids who didn't build that themselves and they become kind of the corporate overlords and owners, it, it turns out that usually within two or three generations that tears a family apart and destroys the company. It turns out when you try to do something noble and turn it over to five or 10 of the guys that are, are working for you as a, as an ESOP or an employee owned company. And then they try to pass the baton one or two times, usually within a couple turns, it, it's back to another unjust system and it, and it dissolves and it tears the company apart, makes a few people rich, but turn, tears the company apart. So, so how, how the fathers and the sons get together <laughs> and decide how we're going to transition trillions of dollars of real property equity and business equity in a way that sets a new foundation and paves the way for the future flourishing of society, I think is one of the most absolutely critical issues facing our society. And it's, it's, I think it's, it's everything you're saying about legacy. It's like, how are we going to take everything that a generation has built and responsibly pass the baton? So it, it doesn't just dissolve, but it endures and it matters. Yeah. It's, Anyway. Yeah, we talked a lot about how when a person has built a large 
company, and I, when I say large, I, I really mean even lower middle market. If you have 50, 60 employees, you're going to be looking at, you know, 40, 50 million a year, perhaps, maybe a little less than that, maybe more, depending on your, your, your industry. And let's say you make $4 million a year in profits and you get a 5X multiplier you sell the company for $20 million and you have all that money, you pay capital gains and then you don't have anything to do. So you get involved in charity and it, it goes on up from there. The, a lot of people sell their company for a hundred, 200 million more up into the billions and they donate money to charities that are solving problems that could have been solved by higher wages and better employment practices and better life development and community development all along the way. So it seems to me that legacy has to include two things. It has to include some kind of a systematologically, going to word there, uh, some kind of system for protecting um, the equity for the future generations, if, if possible. And it also has to address life issues. I'm always impressed with how much I realize I'm not going to see in my grandson's lives as fully mature leader adults. I will be gone by them. But I have a faith in what I contribute into their lives right now. And I can see, I can project it into the future that, yeah. that, that, fa- that interest in life, that, that, that learning, that, that humble, honest learning, that, that enthusiasm, if I can just adjust their trajectory a little bit, I'm affecting the future in a way that I, I have to take by faith but it's not hard to see and how many of us miss that in life. Yeah. We end up with what we think is a legacy, a hospital wing named after us and that's it. Yeah. That makes me think of your, your, your statement on that earlier, we were talking about deferred gratification or sacrifice. It, everything about, It's almost like everything about properly being and doing everything we can to steward what's entrusted to us, including the the people around us and the young people we can influence and then pass the baton, all requires the joyful, exuberant sacrifice of the time and the attention and the effort and the resources that it takes to, to help the rising generation flourish. And, and it's like, that, that is, it is absolutely unbelievable. Like a year ago or whenever it was that, and I might be, forgive me if I'm wrong on this, but whenever it was that we crossed over and a combination of self-inflicted death from substance abuse became the leading cause of death of young people in our nation, it's like, Something is really, 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 really profoundly wrong. And that can only be fixed. There is no healthcare program that can fix it. Like those issues of hopelessness and despair and generate like desperation, lack of meaning, lack of meaningful engagement, lack of meaningful work, lack of meaningful relationships, lack of meaningful existence lack of understanding of why we're here and where we're going and what matters so much that we're going to get out of bed and work together and sacrifice for it till we die while passing the baton every day. It's like that, that deep, sustaining, driving meaning that, that propels us out of bed at 4 a.m. every morning to go like meet God and then get in community and get to work. Like, like there's such a deeper thing there that has to be corrected. Well, Jordan, it looks like we've, um, we've touched on enough areas that each merit a deep dive. 
Yeah. And uh, we were in a hallway lined with doors, and those doors each have great nameplates on them. Um, we've only just begun here. Yeah. What's the, what, what would you, if, if somebody just tuned in kind of accidentally and heard this little first um, incident talk here with us, what would you encourage them to do as a next step if they want to tune their sense of legacy in their life? And what, what should they start contemplating? What should they, what should they ponder? Give a individual answer and a, and a structural answer. The, the individual thing that I would say or encourage is that for reasons we may or may not get into today, um, I believe with all my being to the point of willingness to sacrifice everything that we are at an absolute decision point as a human species on planet Earth about who we are going to become and what we're here to do and how we're going to exist in right relationship to one another across the borders that have separated us in the past and in harmony and right relationship with the environment that has to sustain generations and generations to come and in, and in right relationship to the source and sustainer that's guiding those transformations of life and society through the, through the generations. And so sorting out individual right relationship with God and self and family and community and the world around you has to be the starting point that each of us are most deeply engaged in. Um, so every we're on the edge of determining how generations and generations to come may exist in this world. And the, the massive awakening and revival of heart and spirit that has to occur um, to impel each and every one of us to get ourselves in order and get our families in order and get our communities in order, take responsibility back, get things healthy, get things flourishing, sh clean up those, those sharp edges that Bill was talking about and, and figure out how we're going to, how we're going to set things in order in this decade. Um, that's that. Um, secondly is that I believe with all my heart that none of us can do any of that effectively alone. Um, we are each being created and sustained moment by moment by the creator of the universe. And we are destined and called to become a body. And so I would, I desperately long to connect with everyone who resonates in any way with um, what we're talking about. And if you can't understand what we're talking about, maybe you can feel it in the resonance of voice and spirit. And so if you resonate at all with these topics and themes and ideas and visions of, of how the world could be and the ways that we could work together to, to bring that creator's intent into reality, um, the best thing you could do would be to go to uh, my website and sign up just so that we're structurally connected and not subject to the whims of other powers that be about um, whether we see each other's messages, et cetera. So you can go to um, www.jordannicholas.org. And on the homepage, you'll find a link to join the movement. And if you just click that and, and sign up and contribute, that will enable this work to continue. It'll mean we're structurally connected. It will mean you'll get a weekly update um, from me that will catch you up on any posts or communications or podcasts that happen that week. And it'll give us a way to get moving together. And then we have all sorts of next steps that people can take if they want to get more engaged. Um, on the website right now, um, that is a donation form. And so that is intentional for now. We will probably build an email list too, but we kind of want to separate out people that care um, a penny worth or a dollar worth or a hundred dollars worth from people who 
are just wanting to follow along. And so we're trying to basically build a movement of resonance and commitment. And we have set up a, um, a very robust structure to transparently um, steward the resources that come in for to advance our shared mission and cause. So again, um, go to www.jordannicholas.org and just click join the movement and that will structurally connect us. Thank you, Jordan. It's been an absolute pleasure today as it has been over the past five years. And there's a lot left to uh, ponder, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been exceptional, Bill. I deeply, um, sorry, we just got a little echo there, but it's been uh, exceptional getting to know you. I deeply appreciate your, your friendship and partnership and wisdom and guidance and support. So yeah, thanks for being here right. today. Thanks for interviewing. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon. We'll see you next time. Take care. It was interesting when we were with, um, I really enjoyed our, our, our time with Rupert. Um, but there's, there's such deep, beneath everything, there's such deep unity of, of spirit. Um, but I just love the way that uh, even in our time together, walking through the day um, as so, so many of us um, in our Western society have been hurt and abused by religion. And in, um, you know, the Native American culture is so much more um, profoundly and painfully so. And it's so amazing, though, that beneath, um, beneath those differences that day, just to walk with Rupert and see his constant prayerful interaction with the creator, you know, just constant prayer, you know, prayer before every meal, prayer before every move, prayer before anything. And it's, it's just such a, such a deep, connected, sacred way to be moment through moment. And in the, um, in the, in the Western scriptures, in the, in the Bible, there's this concept of praying without ceasing. Um, but it's, it's that, you know, beneath all the forms, there's just the existence and right relationship with, with the spirit of God, with the, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really profound and encouraging to, um, to be with people that have been walking in those ways and unbroken traditions for, for millennia. The small things, big teachings. That makes me think, Bill, that that first part of um, our conversation, where it's like, man, that sounds that sounds complex. <laughs> you know, how do we make it really simple? And it's a, a, you know, these cultures that have persisted for thousands of years have, have found ways to to build, you know, those understandings into each of the small things that are done, you know, and repeated. We've we're missing so much of that. What does that make you think, Bill? It's I was, um, I think I mentioned this to you, um, how I was talking with Francis and Rico Francis is my son. Um, he has a software business in Boston. I was raised in Minnesota and was familiar with some of the, there are a lot of Indian, American Indian tribes in that region, the Chippewa in my area and Minneapolis in Northern Minnesota, and then down in Southwest. Minnesota, the Lakota, and all the way up into the Dakotas. There is a town um, called Pipestone, Minnesota, and that's where they mine the stone that when you first get it out of the ground and it's not been oxidized, it's very soft and you can carve it. But as soon as it's oxidized, it becomes a very hard stone, and that's what they made their pipes out of. But I was talking to Francis um, not too long ago, and I was contemplating how he and I had this culture between the two of us where um, I taught him that my word is only strong and valuable if it is true. And I, I answer to God. I don't, he doesn't answer to me. Francis didn't answer to me except where I had mature wisdom and could help him. But I always taught him, look, we're both accountable to the truth and it doesn't matter who's right. What matters is, are we growing together and learning together? And so he 
develop a tremendous confidence and he developed the confidence in the ability to admit he might not be right about something, but also his confidence to really pursue something and focus and embrace it. So I was talking about that saying, we have this ability to talk at great depths as two adult peers now, but it's always been a developing process. And I said, how would you describe that, our relationship? And he said, Dad, um, we are able to have strong views lightly held. And that, I think, is critical. I can accept that I have a strong view, but I can't hold on to it tightly. And I can accept that someone else has a strong view. Working with Jordan has been a lot like working with my son, a lot of wrestling with ideas. But respecting that, not getting angry that someone has a strong view and disagrees with me, but hanging in there. We, I'm going to hold my view lightly and you're going to hold yours lightly. But they are strong views. And as, when you're confronting a system around you, you have to be willing to stand strong in the midst of opposition as you ponder the truthfulness of what you're contemplating. I might be wrong. I've learned a lot. I continue to learn a lot. And if I can convey to my grandsons and to anyone else, I have a lot of people that I mentor in various ways, just informally, I don't even keep track of it. But if I can convey to somebody that the love of the journey and the humility of teachableness is the biggest and most important thing, then I can have strong views, but they're adaptable. I might, I'm willing to learn I'm able, I hold them all lightly. And I have to say that I consider that to be such a treasure that I have that relationship with my son that I can, I don't have to be right, but I'm dedicated to seek truth with him. And we don't have to agree, but we love each other and can wrestle with an idea. And there's such deep mutual respect, but it started young. You, you don't just jump into that as a, as a, a father of a 25 year old and say, well, now let's be peers. It doesn't work yeah. that way. Bill, I'm thinking about ab ab abstracting that a little bit. Um, it feels like there's a deep societal. So, so what you're, what you're modeling there. So, so let's say that the worst of, let's say that in the worst excesses of the traditionally masculine expression, you can end up in kind of a totalitarian family where children don't have a voice. They're, they're fearfully conforming their opinions to the abusive and tyrannical father. And um, in doing so, they feel alienated and like they're betraying their soul because they're conforming themselves to a tyrannical and untrue environment based on their father's limitations and corrupt blindness. So maybe that's the, that's like the, the worst of it. What you're describing is a, is a masculine expression of strength subordinated to God mm -hmm. that, that encompasses the both strength and weak, this, the, this individual strength and relative weakness of a child under your care. Um, so you're describing a different way of saying, okay, it's, it's not about a separated structure of authority on earth, so to speak. I, as the potential tyrannical ruler of this household, am also subordinated to God. And your accountability as a child is actually ultimately to God, not me. And so if I'm ever wrong, you need to stand up for yourself and break my rules in order to do what's right before God and out of, you know, out of pure conscience and guidance. And, and it feels like there's a parallel like that to social governance where our, our potentially tyrannical structures of governance, if they get corrupt off track and disconnected from God can end up then exerting dominance and control over individuals and localities who can never no longer do what they think is right. And, and that's like, such a deep principle because the only thing that can set that back in proper order is if everybody's accountable to the same overarching and uniting yeah. spirit. And it's like, it, if we all hold ourselves accountable to that overarching and uniting spirit, 
then it doesn't matter whether we're a child or a father, a city or a state, you know, and a locality or a or a acting federal government. We are all accountable to this highest uniting principle. And we all know if any of us ever deviates from it. And we all are holding ourselves accountable to that highest standard. And we're all conforming ourselves to that image. And so therefore, the closer we get to that, the closer we get to unity with each other. And that that's like the whole that's the whole recipe for the reconciliation and atonement and reintegration of our families and our societies and our marriages and, you know, every aspect of that, um, that expression. Well, there is, um, there are a couple aspects of this that follow along. One is the, the truth that there are little tyrannies springing up, whether one person doesn't feel they get what they want and they're, they're worried about it and they're anxious. And you have that in homeowners associations where you have one do-gooder who just is angry at everybody for not parking their car in the right way or not painting their, their garage door the right color or whatever, all the way up to national tyrannies. And so it's a character issue and a governance issue. But it also has to do, and this is another twist on it, it, it's very much connected to what the authority figure needs and perceives to need. If it's very dangerous for a father or a mother to need the approval of their children, it puts a burden on the children to be the psychological source of strength in the family. Oh, why don't you love mommy or daddy anymore? Oh, come on, give me a hug. And just, you know, you, you're imposing constantly on the child to affirm you. You feel sorry for yourself if the child doesn't. And I, I ran into this, um, in a very strange way. Once I, my uncle Lee is great guy. And he is the youngest of all the siblings on my mother's side. He and one aunt are left. He's the youngest. And I was the oldest of all the grandchildren. And he and I were actually quite close over all the years. And after my father died, I went up to Minnesota. No, it was before that. It was at my grandmother's 100th birthday. I went back up to Minnesota. I spent time with Lee and he told me a story of one time when he was in his, he was like 20 years old and he was attending the university of Minnesota and he was living at home and he was standing on the back porch. Now my grandfather was a Norwegian immigrant. He had been in slavery, in voluntary servitude to, uh, um, to a blacksmith in 1910 when he was just 10 years old and he escaped and ran away on this to the to the sea and never went back to norway he had adventures as a little kid on ships and he learned to be a cook eventually came to the u.s very adventuresome guy but very very stoic very strong in the norwegian sense my grandmother was swedish so she had that slightly more genteel firm of stoicism that the Swedes have more like the French influence on the Swedes. So one time Lee was home from school. He was uh, standing on the back porch of the house and grandpa was standing there. And Lee said that he was just overcome by this feeling that he wanted to give grandpa a hug. Now, Norwegians aren't hugging people. And I, would be a little bit surprised if the Estonians didn't understand this because I, Estonians are, I think, culturally kind of connected to Finland, right? That's also a semi-Stoic culture. So you would understand what I'm talking about. So grandpa didn't, he didn't express his affection very much. Verbally, he might. He was a very funny guy. But Lee gave him a big hug and said, Dad, I love you. And, and grandpa, he said, didn't know what to do. He stood there with his arms down and was very uncomfortable. And then Lee let go. And grandpa said, 
And this struck me like a lightning bolt. He said, you don't know how long I've been waiting for you to do that. Mm -hmm. He had been waiting for affirmation from his son. That burden should never be placed on a child. Sure, you can say, oh, I love you. Know, it's, I'm, so, I, I'm so happy for you. I love when you give me a hug. That's, that's different. He couldn't initiate any affection towards his son. He didn't have that within him. And if we want people to know they're loved, we can't just, just sit around saying, well, you, you get your act together and then show us, you know, express that to me. We have to be the strong ones. We have to be the one that initiate humility and love and affection and kindness yeah. and give them the hugs. Sorry, I'm getting overworked and my microphone knocked my... <laughs> so anyways, that was... If we want to really be a leader, we have to lead in the area of expressing love. And that brings us another, to another question. Does anybody owe me anything? No. Nobody owes me anything. There's a verse in the, in James or one of Paul's statements, oh, nothing to any, oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. So in other words, no one owes me anything, but I owe to love them. And what is love? I'm thinking seriously about what is their highest well-being. And it includes affection. You know, I didn't think my father liked me ever. He was that stern person. But he was living out the culture that he was raised with. His father was also of Norwegian descent. And his mother was a tough German farmer from Wisconsin. And they, he, he had a tough life and eight brothers and sisters. And they, it was a hard, hard for him to find affection. So he didn't know how to express affection to me. That's a little bit of a tangent, but yeah. I think these things are so connected, you know? They're so connected. I mean, those are basically the two things. It's like you, those are the two, those are the two, the two fundamental recipes, right? It's like put, put the creator or God at the center and base everything on love. And, and with those two orienting forces, all things are helping one another. Like all things are, are willing to sacrifice and defer gratification and, and pour themselves out to help the things around them rise towards the fullness of their potential and flourish. Right. And that's, it's such a simple recipe. <laughs> it's such a simple recipe that we are so far from as a society. And it's, it's the, it's the opposite of of the dysfunctional self-interested trying to get love without being able to express it. Right. It's, it's like if, if everybody goes first in love, you know, that that's where the amazing idea, you know, that's where, that's where someone like Jesus, you know, shatters the shatters the standard by going, you know, everybody loves their friends and family around them. Right. The, the true test is, you know, can you love your enemies and those who are actively and malevolently persecuting you and maybe crucifying you? Like, then you're approaching God's love that falls on both the evil and the good, right? It's like God's permeating perfect love that is just crying out to be manifest. It's like, how many people can we get quickly enough to reorient their lives around that which is guiding the subsequent transformations generation by generation over time and embody that spirit of love, which is somehow inherently connected to what you were saying, Bill, about the pursuit of truth, like the pursuit of that absolute standard that we're all accountable to. It's, you know, it's so simple, truth and love and aiming at the highest thing. Well, it gets very practical as you form an organization that has to treat people in a one way or another. And, you know, like Jesus said, if he let he who would be great among you be the servant of all. And that goes along with, uh, and probably is underneath Jim Collins thinking in his book, Good to Great, the level five leader's main concern is to see that everybody finds their place where their gifts and talents are functioning well, and they're contributing to the, the work of the whole, and they're happy doing that. You know, that's yeah. what I want for my kids. That's what we should want for our, our fellow, um, 
uh, workers and team members, each other. Well, let's start to model it right here together. So, <laughs> yes. beautiful. Well, thank you. Thank you for the uh, extended discussion. Uh, Hello again, everybody. Thank you again so much for your time and attention today. We know it's valuable and you have many places you can spend it. We appreciate you being with us here today. Again, if you resonate with the spirit and would like to see this work advance, please let us know by going to www.jordannicholas.org and clicking join the movement. That'll connect you up and, and ensure we have a direct structural connection to each other so we can advance together into the future. Please also take the time to click subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcasting platform. We'll be back in the next couple of days with the next part two episode with Bill Larson, where we'll dive into some of our battles with corruption and injustice and talk a little bit about what we've learned from that and what's next for the mission. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. God bless.